We're continuing to debate the nomination of Judge Gorsuch to serve as Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. My colleagues on both sides of the aisle have said that this is an important moment for the United States Senate. I couldn't agree more. I think it's important to reflect on why we're here and how we got here. Before I turn to the Supreme Court and the current debate, let me take it just a few minutes to talk about lower court nominees and provide a little bit of history and context, especially for the benefit of some of the senators who weren't here over the last few years. I'm going to start way back in the spring of 2001. President George W. Bush had just been elected president. As we know, we all know in fact, it was a close election and it was hardly, it was hardly, hardly fought. The Senate was closely divided with the Republicans in control. Given how close the presidential election was, there were elements of the hard left who refused to accept the results of that election. Some blamed Ralph Nader, others blamed Governor Jeb Bush, and still others blamed the Supreme Court. Many on the hard left claimed that President George W. Bush wasn't, quote unquote, a legitimate president. Liberal interest groups were egging on the Democratic leadership to fight the new president at every turn. Now, that still sounds very familiar for this year that we're in. At the same time, one major concern for the hard left, liberal interest groups, was that President Bush, whom they claimed wasn't legitimate, would be able to nominate conservative judges. Again, doesn't that sound familiar? Senator Cornyn went over some of this same subject yesterday, but it deserves discussion now, and it deserves as a reminder where we've been before, because sometimes the past predicts the future. So in the spring 2001, the hard left interest groups went to the Senate Democratic leadership with a plan. According to the New York Times, 42 of the Senate's, and this is a quotation, 42 of the Senate's 50 Democrats attended a private retreat where a principal topic was forging a unified party strategy to combat the White House on judicial nominees, end quote. Thinking about 2017, doesn't that sound a little familiar? At that meeting, Cass Sunstein, Marsha Greenberger, and Lawrence Tribe spoke at the retreat and pitched to the Democratic, the Democrats present there, their idea of how this crusade could proceed. One to attend, I quote, According to one attendee, and I want to quote, they said it was important for the Senate to change the ground rules. And there was no obligation to confirm someone just because they're scholarly and erudite, end of quote. Well, let's think about that for a moment. Why do you suppose they believe they needed to change the ground rules for confirming judges. It's because up to that point, you didn't filibuster judges. You just didn't. And you heard the minority or the majority leader just speak to that point in his short remarks this morning about how things have changed after 200, more than 200 years. Well, as it happened, less than a month after the caucus retreat, Senator Jeffords from Vermont switched parties and begun caucusing, began caucusing with the Democrats. That threw the majority to the Democrats for the next 18 months. And then they lost the election of 2002 
And in the spring of 2003, Republicans were back in the majority. Now back in the minority, Senate Democrats went ahead with plans that were enunciated at that retreat to change the ground rules. For the first time in the history of the Senate, they began to systematically filibuster circuit court nominees. Not because they believed the nominees weren't qualified, because these nominees were qualified not because they believe those nominees didn't have the necessary experience, because these nominees did have the necessary experience. They filibustered those nominees because they believed that they were conservative judges. So with respect to appellate court nominees, Senate Democrats, at the behest of the far left, took the unprecedented step of using the filibuster in a very systematic way for the first time in Senate history. At the time, there was a lot of debate about changing the rules, dubbed the so-called nuclear option, so that nominees would be, afforded, would be afforded an up or down vote consistent with Senate history and practice. Well, Republicans exercised restraint and agreed to step back. Then President Obama became president. Our side didn't like the use of the filibuster for judges, but we also didn't think there should be two sets of rules, one for a Republican president and one for a Democratic president. Common sense tells you that that's a legitimate position to take. We defeated two circuit court nominees one to the Ninth Circuit and one to the D.C. Circuit. Then, President Obama nominated three individuals to the D.C. Circuit. One side denied cloture, our side denied cloture on these three nominees to the D.C. Circuit. Well, at that point, their side didn't like playing by the rules that they wrote. So, Majority Leader Reid, then Majority Leader Reid, took another unprecedented step. In November 2013, he utilized the so-called nuclear option to eliminate the very tactics that they pioneered. So, nuclear option becomes effectively the Reid rule. So, that's how the filibuster was first used on lower court nominees and later eliminated. Senate Democrats took the unprecedented step to utilize that. And, when, and then when it no longer benefited them, they used unprecedented means to eliminate it. So this brings me back to where we are today and the rest of this week, to talking about a Supreme Court nominee Judge Gorsuch. Everyone knows that we had a big debate last year about whether to proceed with a Garland nomination. There were 52 Republicans who believed that we should follow Senate history and tradition and not proceed with a nomination in the middle of a heated election year. And I know it frustrates my colleagues to hear me say it, but the fact of the matter is that in 1992, when then Senator Biden was chairman of the Judiciary Committee, he announced that he wouldn't hold a hearing to fill a vacancy in the last year of President Bush's term. So last year, we followed the precedent that Senator, then Senator Biden described in 1992 for all of the same reasons he discussed. And you get back to this common sense principle. Can you have one rule for Republican presidents and another rule for Democratic presidents? We didn't feel you could. And of course, everyone in this chamber knows that if the shoes were on the other foot, the Democrats would have done the same thing because they said they would. In fact, President Obama's 
former White House counsel admitted as much. She said she would have recommended the same course of action if the tables were turned. So now, here we are, April 2017, with the nominee before us. Just like in 2001, we've had just a contentious, we had just had a very contentious presidential election. It was close. It was hard fought. And frankly, some on the hard left refused to accept the results of the election. Once again, left-wing groups are egging on the minority leader to take another unprecedented step with respect to judicial nominations. Only this time, they want him to lead the first, very first, partisan filibuster of a Supreme Court nomination in United States history. And based on the vote we had yesterday, it appears that 44 Democrats are prepared to follow the minority leader on this fool's errand. No Supreme Court nomination in our country's entire history has ever failed because of a partisan filibuster. There is no getting around that fact. Abe Fortas, they might refer to, was subjected to a bipartisan filibuster over ethical concerns when President Johnson tried to elevate him to be Chief Justice. Now, Justice Thomas was confirmed by a vote of 52 to 48. I was here for that nomination. A single senator, any senator, could have demanded a cloture vote. But out of 100 senators, none did that. Why? for a simple common sense fact and 200 years of history. You don't filibuster Supreme Court nominations. But today is entirely different. The minority is committed to filibustering this fine nominee, the first partisan filibuster in U.S. history. So here we are. The president has nominated an exceptionally qualified judge to take Judge Scalia's seat on the Supreme Court. And the Democrats will break new ground again by conducting a partisan filibuster of that nominee. Republicans aren't the ones breaking new ground here. As a matter of fact, the Democrats' own vice presidential nominee last year emphatically promised that the Democrats would further change the rules to make sure an expected President Clinton's nominees couldn't be filibustered. So at the end of the day, the fact is that if Democrats insist on a filibuster, Republicans will insist on following the practice of, that senators have followed for more than 200 years, and that is not to filibuster have a partisan filibuster for somebody going to the Supreme Court. We don't conduct partisan filibusters of Supreme Court nominees, and we're certainly not going to start with this highly qualified nominee. And I hope those that think back 16, 17 years, when this meeting of Democrats in a retreat Came to, the came to the conclusion you had to break new ground, that they realized that that has poisoned the well of the comedy traditional of the United States Senate. And I think maybe a lot of them realized that was a mistake, as we realize that that's a mistake. And it'd be nice to get back to the comedy of the Senate that existed on judges prior to 15 or 16 years ago. But that's going to take people on their side who were present at that same retreat who are still in the United States Senate to drill a new well because the present one is poisoned. And we need to get back to the comedy that we've had. 